Hello everyone and welcome to Meet the Cello Maker, part of Cellissimo, Music for the Senses, which is the first edition of Galway's International Cello Triennale, running from the 25th to the 31st of March 2021, presented by Music for Galway and Galway 2020. And we're here to talk about the Galway Cello as part of the online Cellissimo exhibition, which is curated by Rob Diath and runs all the way through the festival and beyond. My name is Philip Fogarty. I'm the musician who came up with the concept of the Galway cello, and with me in the virtual, I have the distinguished luthier, Kouros Toxidae, the man responsible for turning that concept into a reality and giving us the Galway cello. Hello, Kouros. Hello, Philip. Hello. You're no longer living in Galway, Kouros. You're in Bray now, but you were based in Ballanderry. What do you miss most about the West? Well, I have to say I do miss uh, Galway. There were good times and the vibes and, and you know, sometimes going for a, a coffee uh, down Shop Street or Main Street. And, you know, so it was nice. Uh, I, I miss that. The, and friends, you know, so it, cool. it, it always had a good friendly feel about it. Sure. And I'm sure, well, after lockdown, I'm sure that Bray will offer plenty of that as well, hopefully. Tell us okay. a little about your background and your work as a luthier. Okay, Philip. Um, so I was born in Germany and uh, I, after school, I initially trained as a cabinet maker. Um, and then sort of what happened is I, I traveled and uh, I landed with... Um, Tom Cusson and Clarine Vandros, and uh, I started working with him. And I got interested in the world of musical instruments, but I needed some formal training. So that brought me to New York, uh, the School of Violin Making. Uh, it's based near Nottingham, and it's under the patronage of Beers, j &A Beers. So I did my course, my three-year training there. And um, with that, in the pocket. I came back then to Galway and very kindly, Tom helped me to set up and I started around 2000, I think, uh, 2001, I set up my own kind of little operation workshop in Galway and started working um, wow. with, in the world of the gold instrument because that's where I always wanted to end up. That's some real pedigree. That's some real pedigree there. Uh, let's have a look, uh, without further ado, at some of the, uh, your handiwork. Let's look at the Galway cello. I think we have a photograph of it there. Should be coming up now, the finished article. And oh, yeah. recently photographed uh, here in Salt Hill by Anita Murphy. So, yeah. And the instrument uh, is made of Galway materials, Galway woods, which you're going to tell us more about in a, in a moment. Uh, Kouros and its concert debut is in the hands of Hedford musician Naomi Beryl with a piece specially commissioned for the Galway cello from Bill Whelan. Now, um, so I, I, I originally came up with the concept myself of the Galway cello as a response to the themes of landscape and migration in Galway 2020's call for submissions a couple of years back. Uh, tell me, Kouros, what was your first thought when Music for Galway approached you with the idea of making this? Can we see a couple of more shots of the cello? I think we have them there. Yeah, so I, I just uh, fire away here. So yeah. uh, while, while we're seeing the focus come up. Um, yeah, so it was actually Anna, Anna Lardy very kindly came, came, approached me about this. And the funny thing is, now a cello is one of the bigger instruments in, in the gold section, so to speak. I mean, you couldn't get, after that, you're into the double bass. And immediately my thought was, it is big enough to integrate something interesting into this cello. And, mm -hmm. and the natural place for that would be obviously the head, the scroll because that's the calling card of the maker. A lot of times, that's how we distinguish uh, makers looking at their F holes and especially at the scroll, how it's shaped. And to me, it kind of was automatically saying that that could be a perfect opportunity to represent Galway up there. And there it is. We have a photograph of the scroll right there. 
And yeah. You, can't get you can see the heart, the crown, and the two hands, basically the clatter ring coming. It was almost like a, um, the concept of a swan. Maybe I was influenced by the clatter and the swans there. I don't know, but it is almost like a swan. Out of the peg box grows the clatter ring. So, so that, that is kind of the... Um, now, the interesting thing, of course, here is the fact that you reworked it in three dimensions. I think we have another shot of it there uh, from, a, from a slightly different angle there. Yes. Oh, yes. Very <laughs> nice. Yeah. And um, again, the, the beauty about it, Philip, was when you look at it, you could pack so much detail into it. I, I had to physically stop myself when I was making a, a, a kind of like a trial run. I kind of realized, oh my God, I could put so much detail into it, but I kind of focused on really emphasizing the heart, the crown and the hands, you know? Yeah, yeah. Okay, what, what is the most difficult thing about making a, a cello in your opinion? Well, the, really it's the size that makes it difficult because you can easily get lost in the size because uh, when you, in comparison to a violin, or viola, cello is the, the it's much more uh, the there's a vastness to the space and and as we're shaping it or as I'm shaping it and remember it's all carved out of solid pieces and we'll talk about the timber in a while but it is important to take a step back and look at it and say oh you know here's my center line here's the outside how do I get from A to B what shapes do I want to go for so that is, and also with bending the sides, which are basically thin pieces bent with steam, it's easy uh, that they can buckle or respond. It's a natural process. Timber is natural. So it'll do whatever it wants to do. And there's no point fighting it. And you just have to go with whatever it wants to do. There's a certain flow to it. Yes, yes. Now, of course, there is um, a connection here with another famous cello which and you brought that to the table tell us a little bit about that yeah so ever since we were in newark in the school they had access to the gore booth cello now at the time when i was in new york i didn't know much about the background but only afterwards it all the, the all the dots connected and it turned out that actually the owner was the keen amateur cellist who had a house or residence up in Sligo, Lissadell House, but was also uh, uh, based in London. And we don't know whether the cello was really any time uh, ever over in Sligo. Now, it could it's most likely, uh, but it's it most had, like we had like the right. cast. Yeah. So, um, so basically, I had access to the, the cast, and um, here we can see the cast, yes. Here we can so, see the cast, yeah. So this is basically, um, I, I couldn't re resist, I, I had to put it next to it, side by side. This is the cast cast of the original front on the left. So mm -hmm. what they did do, they had to restore the instrument, they took the front off, and... Uh, when they had the front off, they made a cast. And we, all the students in Newark, had access to this cast and could make their own copy. So mm -hmm. this is the closest thing I could get to the original cello. And there it is. That's the cast of an original Antonio Stradivari uh, B form cello. Um, that yes. was the possession of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the Gore Booths. And um, so, yeah, that must have been quite a thing to. Uh, to have that contact. Well, funny enough, uh, on the sideline, uh, when we, I went up to see the Lissadell house and I mentioned to the current owners that I have access to this cast. And they did at the time say they were quite keen, possibly to get a copy made, but it kind of fizzled mm -hmm. out. We, we never got a chance really to go yeah. well into this. But what mm -hmm. I've done here is basically using light Yes. Put them side by side. So you can almost, if you look at the left and the right, you can see the light and the shadow. And that's quite often how we work in the field as a Luthier, using yeah. light and, and shadow to yeah. expose the three dimensions. Yes. Yes. Well, 
Okay, let's back up a little bit through the photos there. Uh, that's the third one in, I think. Uh, yeah. There's a couple there. Let's go back to the first one there. Uh, talk us through the process. What are we looking at here? So maybe I, I tell a bit about, so the timber uh, here is, that's the sycamore from Tium. So I, I, I had access because we wanted to use local wood. So it was actually a, a tree that was felled in Tium. So it was well cured and ready to go. So mm -hmm. these are two plates that are glued together. And we can see if we look in the center, that kind of rough patch, that's basically where the two pieces join together. Right. And that will all be shaped. And the, what looks like all this grisly stuff around is actually where I just basically remove, we call this the rough arching, we remove all the rough timber before we start even getting into it. And then it gets really tedious with the, with the gouge, cutting into it and shaping the plate. So that's basically Irish sycamore uh, all the way from tomb and mm. it's been shaped. And bear in mind, after the shape from the outside, everything has to be hollowed from the inside to follow the shape from the outside. Okay, let's let's step through. Let's step through another photo there and we'll have a look. Yes, that's I I thought this is quite poignant. Uh, so here we have another part of this same tree. These are basically the sides. Now Shellis, I, I when I do a talk with musicians, I like to bring the sides of an instrument because quite often they don't realize how thin and delicate the pieces are. So these sides are about 1.2 millimeters thick and they're bent with steam. So you can imagine the, the height of this is about um, 20 plus, you know, centimeters. So they buckle, they do their own thing. Now, what we see in the center, this piece with the holes is actually a piece that helps me to stabilize the form and keep things together. Yes. Later on, that is removed and the blocks are shaped. We see in the corner, there is uh, four corner blocks, a top block and a bottom block. Yes. And all these are shaped um, and the form comes out. It's, it's actually a piece of MDF. It's just there to stabilize because everything is so fragile. Wow. And then on top of that, then, of course, you had the cast of the cello, which we saw through there. I think that's the third photograph again, uh, which we will step through. Are we there? We are. And there it is again. And then after that, then the, 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 the next photo after that, then we have. Yeah. Um, what? Incidentally, um, we ah, should yeah. say the front was made of German spruce uh, yes. because it was very hard to get spruce of that quality, of the quality and that caliber here. Mm. So what we did use was an old mature piece of spruce yeah. to match with the rest, but the rest is all local well, wood. And yes. part of the reason for that, of course, is that um, uh, seasons can be better defined in some climates, and so you get a different form of growth than you would in Ireland, and so that was necessary. And then, of course, obviously, yeah. you have woods like ebony, which you're not going to find uh, outside Kilcolgan somewhere. So yeah. that obviously was was um, something that had to be addressed. So yeah. oh, move on to the to the, the the next photograph. There we we're talking about the. Yes. Oh yeah. So we've got the head. Um, so this is basically the starting point of the the neck. So this is a block. Now again, there's pieces glued on as padding. I call it padding. It's basically bits glued on to square it off. So we we can actually in the background next to my glasses see a nice little set square that I use to square yeah. everything off. It has to you start from a square point, and the piece on top is a piece of perspex that I use as a template. So this is basically you're, you're starting from a two-dimensional aspect and mm -hmm. then it gets interesting when we turn that into a three-dimension. And I think I included a photo there of the finish. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the, um, there, there was a series of short videos that was produced about the making of the cello where it shows you going from two to three dimensions with the, with, with the clay tryouts, first of all. Yes. Uh, that was really interesting as well. Let's look at the finished, um, at the finished part of the next photograph. Well, that's before it's actually varnished or before it's finished. Yeah. It so this is what we call, uh, again, this is the um, Irish sycamore, local wood. 
The black pieces we see at the bottom of the picture, that is ebony. Now, now like you rightly said, we couldn't find ebony here in, in, in Ireland. And we had to use it because we wanted to make a functional cello that people, amateur, professional players can play. So it had to have the rigidity and stability in the fingerboard. So there was no compromise. We couldn't compromise on that. So it had to be something durable. Um, so yeah, you, using that now, the just such a motif, the plaudering ring motif, which is so kind of beloved of people. Uh, it's uh, my mother wore that on her uh, the, the, as as her wedding ring, um, and using that was such a bold stroke, even something of a risk artistically. But you were. You you were pretty sure that this was going to work. Yeah, I th I think there were reservations because, like, look, there's always the risk. We we didn't want to make a uh, a, a cello with, shall I say, like a big shamrock on the back or 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 something carved into. Mm -hmm. We 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 had to really the line was we had to draw the line that it wasn't going to be sort of tacky or. Uh, uh, you know, non-elegant. Let's put it that way. And yeah. and I, I had to use a little bit of convincing power. And when we look back in history, we can see actually um, Stradivarius did the same thing. He did use, uh, he did do some carving himself. There is a uh, evidence of a um, of a harp he carved himself. So, um, so looking at that, you know. It's it's perfectly legit to you know change move away from the traditional scroll. Yes, yes. Well, certainly the fact that you uh, worked it in three dimensions the way that you did uh, has certainly borne you out as far as I'm concerned. It's it's really incredible what you've done with the scroll. I think. Um, so um, the um, you weren't alone during the making of the cello. You were filmed as well. Yes. You guys followed you around. You had Eamon Dunn and I think Paddy Hayes was following you around with the making of the cello. How was that as an experience? Well, um, I have to first of all ex express my uh, uh, deepest gratitude to uh, uh, Stephen and Eamon for uh, their patience and their intuition and um, to go along with it. It was tricky, I have to say. I've never been in that position. It's not what we normally do, where we're kind of like the people hiding in the background and then the player comes out in the, uh, whatever, the fancy dress or the tuxedo and they play and they're in the limelight, we're in the background. So that was new. And there was a bit sort of that, you know, the old cliche, uh, here's one I made in the oven early on. And you had to do a little bit of that. So I had to spend a lot of time preparing, planning the steps. What am I going to do? on the day, um, what can we pack into? Because they had a certain amount of time and mm -hmm. camera was rolling. So we had to do something and we had to make it interesting. There's no point filming me sort of there gouging away shavings or arching away. That, that's, that gets tedious, but I think we found some interesting shots. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I, th I think so too. What are your hopes now for the future of the Galway cello? Well, I would very much like to see the cello being played as much and seen as much by as many people as possible. And this is, we're talking beyond Galway. I mean, it is a great representation of music for Galway and Galway as the city, but I think it would be important to bring it beyond that so that I think the worst um, case scenario would be to, to shove it into a back room and put it into a case and say, here, here you go, you know, uh, uh, done and dusted. I think it's important, even if it's not played, if there isn't a concert happening. I mean, what I'd love to see if it was somewhere on display that the public could go and see, like, a lot of cities do that. I mean, when you go around Cremona, the birthplace of Stradivarius, and you go there, the municipal uh, museum mm -hmm. has 
instrument belonging to Stradivarius on permanent display. Yeah. So, so it would be a fantastic opportunity and a drawing point to, say, the Galway City Museum or something, and to say, here, if it's not played, it goes in there, it has a nice case with the label or something, and people can come, and it, I guarantee you it would be a wonderful attraction to yeah. the city. Yeah. Well, let's hope it gets a good uh, uh, need more than displayed, though. I would like to see that. Uh, oh, yeah, we, of course, want to see it play any instrument. And I have to say, uh, again, there is some museums, they have instruments and they're a fantastic collection, but they're not being played. And I think that's a real shame. I mean, an instrument is something that needs to be played. Mm. Full stop. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm sure uh, that those watching would have a ton of questions for you about this. And um, no doubt, hopefully, they will have the chance to meet with you in person at future Galway. Hopefully, uh, yes. Chorus, thank you so much for talking with me. You can learn more about uh, Kouros and his work by visiting his website at the violins.ie. Well done to you, Kouros, for uh, nabbing that domain name, by the way. Well done. Thank indeed. you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Struck a block. <laughs> so uh, here we are then. This talk will remain accessible online in the exhibition section of the online Chilisimo Presence. That exhibition, as we said, being curated by Rob Diath. Details for all Chilisimo events are available and bookings can be made on Music for Galway's website at www.musicforgalway.ie and the Galway Cello is sponsored by MJ Conroy. You have been watching myself, Philip Fogarty, in conversation with Luthier Kouros Talks Today, the man who made the Galway Cello a reality. Thank you for being with us. Thanking you.